Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Movies You Can Learn From. I'm Jay Fidel. Today is reviewing Killers of the Flower Moon, which is a very, very interesting movie. It will captivate you. There it is, Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro and a woman called Lily Gladstone, who you will meet. Okay, so let's talk about the historical background. It's a novel, but it speaks of true events. Um, and a true circumstance, a true um, a, a true moment in, in the history of the United States and the history of the Indians in Oklahoma, the Osage Indians in Oklahoma. So joining me is Stephanie Stahl-Galton. Um, I'm so happy to see her. Uh, welcome to the show, Stephanie. Nice to see you back. Nice to be back. Yeah. Thank so you. What's, what's the historical? Can you paint the picture of the historical tableau on which this movie is based. Well, I think that, uh, as you said, it's it's based on uh, the real thing. So this actually is a, a an experience of life for this part of the country, which uh, is uh, Oklahoma, and these are the Osage Indians who have been been moved there. They they were uh, uh, they were actually forced to make that move into territory that they were unfamiliar with, and then. Um, they settled themselves into the best situation they could. And uh, this was probably in the 19th century, in the 1880s, you know, post-Civil War, but not, not so much at the end of the, the century. And I wonder, there, actually, if they, if they came west along with the Cherokees who went from Georgia also to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. Uh, Oklahoma was some of the worst land in the then country, and I think they were the government was sending Indians to Oklahoma, thinking they weren't giving up very much because this was really marginal land. That's why you have the Trail of Tears under Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. That's why uh, later on uh, you have you have the Osage Indians coming from Missouri, Kansas, uh, and Arkansas, I believe. And so they wound up in what the government considered really bad, useful, useless land. And um, everybody is in uh, Oklahoma. Um, and this is this movie is set, by the way, in the late teens, after World War One, right? And in the twenties. Go ahead. Hey, that's a little bit later than I uh, noted. Uh, yeah, and and of course uh, the cruelty of the President Andrew Jackson at, at the time was astounding, uh, along with some other uh, themes in the, in the movie. But he did uh, have them escorted um, into this new territory and, and lost lots of people along the way. There was no mercy. It was a, it was a forced march into this territory. But uh, they went with um, all that they brought with them, whatever they could carry, but they themselves were strong and they established themselves as best they could, but in a very poverty-stricken situation. There was nothing there that uh, they could really do agriculture with and be very successful. So it was very tough times. But then the irony is, of course, that they did then have the at the discovery of oil. So the 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 point is the cruelty and the lack of responsiveness of the president Andrew Jackson and those that moved these people hundreds and hundreds of miles that they had to walk to. Uh, they were there were many uh, efforts to keep some mercy in this picture and give them some help, but that nothing happened. And then, of course, as I was saying, the the uh, irony was that the land had nothing on its surface that these people were familiar with or could uh, use as a means of producing their uh, benefits in their lives. But they did have something underneath, which was enormous uh, uh, oceans uh, of oil, which then were theirs. And they were able, they became very rich because of the um, explosion of oil that they discovered under the land. But um, I think that um, the story um, what was already very, very sad, but with the discovery of the oil and the riches that they then purportedly had access to, they st still were left in uh, a position of subjugation and oppression and inability to, to manage it and to make it work for the betterment of their own lives. And uh, this is where we get then the 
the entry of um, other people into the situation who were there to, on the surface, help these people out. But it, it, what, what the movie is about is the theme of how the um, oppression uh, was made to uh, be systematic and systematic about making sure that the money was not theirs and that the money could be obtained by other people who were not looking out for their best interests, but rather coming in to take advantage of them. And I think that what has happened um, in, in this story that is, again, based on real facts is that these these people who were portrayed in the movie as the scoundrels who came in to help them, but really were helping themselves, were um, able to be so duplicitous and bring themselves into the situation and were mostly white men and looking for resources such as these people had. And they were able to um, manage these people in ways that put them um, in, in the worst possible position possible. And, and they were unable to in any way take charge or control of their own resources. And I know Jay was talking about earlier that issue of incompetence. They even labeled them because they, they didn't have skills. They hadn't been educated. So they were looking for help, but the help came in and took advantage of all that they couldn't do. So I think that... Um, I think in the Indians were legally traded, uh, probably under the laws of Oklahoma, but maybe under federal law, as less than competent. And uh, I guess that was because they were Indians. It was pure racism. And they were wealthy. They owned large tracts of land, you know, reservations that they'd been given. And at the time they were given these reservations, nobody realized uh, what oil meant and that there was lots of oil under them. Um, but in the, I guess, the teens, John D. Rockefeller was discovering all his oil holdings, you know, and and people were, when Ford was building cars, and uh, oil became very valuable. And all of a sudden, the Indians found oil, and they realized what it meant. And they invited, um, you know, these oil companies in on the land uh, to drill for oil. And they had a scene there. I wondered how they got that scene. A scene there of virtually hundreds of oil wells, wooden oil wells. As far as the eye could see it, it was all owned by the Indians. They were wealthy, but they were treated as incompetent. They could not take legally take control of their own affairs. So they had to have a uh, uh, you know a guardian. That was the term um, to do anything, including draw money out of their own account. Um, and uh, you saw some of that in the beginning of the movie, and you realized that these really, you know. These really bad guys were uh, controlling the money and and t and dipping into it, and the Indians were getting what was left, even though it was all theirs. So you began to get the sense of how the Indians were being mistreated, but it got much worse. You want to talk about that? Well, it, I see it's coming up in my mind, and and very painfully because of the 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 way that they were managed by people that themselves really um, had nothing um, in mind to be helpful to them, but, but really came in and, and took advantage of these people. As I said, not only at the level of we know how to do this and we'll take care of it and you, you don't know how to do it and so you don't have the capacity and so we will have to control you. And they established these relationships with uh, these men who were who were these guardians who had to be approached to get any money at all. And then they had not to allow the Indians to have the money. But, um, but I think that the, the, the very, very sad part of all of this and the, and the um, wickedness that is coming up, uh, that's displaying how, how difficult and how deplorable has been this relationship during the development of our country at that time uh, between um, Western, uh, the Western way of doing things and the indigenous people. Yeah. So well, when I when I refer to it, it got worse. What I mean is, and this is not dissimilar from treatment of the Native Hawaiians here in Hawaii. Um, th they owned the land. Uh, there was no real system 
for mm, devolving the land on the next generation. And so you had to look to, uh, you know, uh, you had to look to the, the way it, it worked without a will and who, who inherited what, okay? And um, this was apparently early in the game of this kind of uh, intestate succession arrangement, no wills, and it, it just went down the family. And if you had a larger share because of your place on the family tree, just the way things worked in Hawaii back in the 19th century, uh, then you got more money. And our heroine, uh, uh, Lily uh, Glad Gladstone, uh, who a beautiful woman, really, I mean, as a, an actress, um, she was, she had a full charge. She had a large share. Okay, so that made her a bit of a target by any of these wise guys howling, wise, wise guy howlies that were coming in there to try to latch on to the Indian money. So if you married somebody with a, with a full share um, and then succeeded that person and survived that person, you were going to inherit her share of the oil. And that was big bucks. So the Indians were not sophisticated about this. Uh, they didn't realize that it really wasn't romance at all. It was the law of intestate succession and what, and what their husbands and children were going to inherit from them. Uh, and that opens a whole new chapter in how they were abused. And uh, the, movie, the movie speaks of a, a sort of history of all these Indians who had died under strange circumstances in that town. I think it was Fairfax was the name of the town, I think. That, it was fair. Yes. It was. They, they died from, you know, who knows what, but it was like the wasting illness. Uh, it was probably poison. Sometimes they were shot. It was a whole, you know, panoply of possibilities about how they died, but it was always, you know, a, a kind of uh, sus suspicious. And when they died, some somehow they died would inherit, you know, right? And, and little by little, their birthright was was being conveyed uh, to to others, the hobby guys. So um, this is very troublesome. It's one thing uh, to marry a woman and then naturally inherit her, her her wealth in the oil. It's another thing to have her killed early and then inherit everything early. And that's what, what was happening. And the the uh, to see the patterns emerge uh, in in this in this. Uh, approach that the uh the the um the leaders the guardians and those that were there to get the money what they did is that you could see the pattern of the deaths go right along with the inheritance line so as jay says the the families were taken out almost one by one either by the poor health and no support for anything like that they were suffering with diabetes and all kinds of di dilemmas that there, there was no medical care for, nobody much provided anything. It did come up at the end that they started to do that. But that, that was very difficult to see uh, people, young people, um, healthy people, and who had inherited all, who had all of this uh, resource and money and they couldn't get any help. So they would die. And then the man that was married to maybe an older sister would come along and then pick up again with the next sister in line, and and we'd go through the same thing there. And sometimes that was a a more pernicious or direct approach to using poison or taking people out, you know, directly with um, weapons. But then they would move it right on down until they got to the one remaining inheritor, and then that person was in in, in complete jeopardy of of being. Um, uh, sailed and also being brought around to get into relationship and marry and then give those inheritance rights not to their own children even but to this this uh, usually white man um, that or as 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 Jay said the Halley types uh, but um, they would uh, it was a fleece it was a fleecing machine because the doctors the medical establishment in that town were all complicit um, and they and they didn't take care of these people. They let them die. Sometimes they provided the poison. Um, the law enforcement officers in that town uh, looked, looked the other way, and there were some really blatant uh, shootings in the town, in the middle of the town, or in the woods near the town. People would walk up to 
somebody who was going to inherit and just shoot him, bang. And so uh, the whole town was kind of organized around ripping off the Indians. And as, as people came into the town, young, young men out of uh, uh, other places or with some family connections, in fact, that was um, how one of the, the Ernest Burkhart, the Leonardo DiCaprio uh, character, came into town. And what was, what was done to him as a young man out of the service and trying to reestablish himself and had a, a re, a, an un uncle living there. And uh, you could see the the entire game being played with the uncle doing the wink, wink, nod, nod thing about if you like girls and you might want to think about some of these here. And if you want to take on the step of getting married, this is a good place to do it. And then slowly that would unravel as being uh, a, a tactic or a strategy to, to bring in another uh, Indian person with a large uh, wealth. Uh, claim, and that then they would marry them and bring them into the family. And this 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 person that was played by um, can you just restart that question that answer? One chilling piece of this movie is to actually see not only the patterns of the deaths that were directly almost like primogenitor, and which didn't involve so many males in the of the Indians, they had involved women too. They they all had their claims, so it didn't matter whether they were women or men, but they would come into the town and they would see what their opportunities were, where they thought at first maybe they could help and be the oil men, but no, they there were bigger opportunities that were presented and encouraged. And so uh, DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio came into town as a, a recently, uh, a recent soldier now out of the service and looking to use his uncle as a way to get a life started and get a job and have some income. And the uncle of DiCaprio, that who, who's Robert De Niro was. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. It was, uh, that was a fantastic character. And, and you wouldn't even recognize either DiCaprio or, or De Niro. They were, they were so into these characters and so, so tightly uh, identified with them. So William Hale, the uncle, or De Niro, would uh, not only um, play the, the gracious uh, gentleman of the city, who he had done very well by that time, but also was the leader for these young, young men who would come and wanted to treat this, uh, uh, this young man as a son. And the chilling part of this more discreet and under the surface tactic was how absolutely um, uh, it got into the the, in, the intimate and private details of people's lives. So he would uh, talk with uh, his his nephew who was in town about the kinds of work that he could do, and while he was doing that, he could find uh, people that he might want to. Con consider having a relationship with or getting married. And so that, that, that just laid out and, you know, lots of uh, wink, wink, nod, nod about, you know, having relationship, liking girls, getting married, which is such a taking on that responsibility with the clear message that this is all about get out there and get us another hook into what is this wealth that these people have and have no business having because they don't know how to handle it. We're skipping over a lot of content. This is a three and a half hour movie which is loaded with contents while you want to see it twice uh, to catch it all. But uh, at the end, um, Robert De Niro character encourages uh, Leonardo DiCaprio to actually poison his wife. And arguably he had feelings for her and she certainly had committed to him. She was a really sweet wife. And um, he, he, he would tell her one minute that he loved her and the next minute he would slip her some poison. Um, fantastic scenes, um, but mind you, the character, the Robert, uh, rather the Leonardo DiCaprio character, was not a smart character. It's like the movie we reviewed before, Downsizing. Uh, Matt Damon was not particularly smart character. He was uh, the lead of the movie, and DiCaprio was the lead of the movie. But they didn't. Neither of them played smart characters. And and here's this guy trying to poison a wife who is completely dedicated to him um, for her money because because uh, Robert De Niro has encouraged him to do so. And in the end, uh, I find it very interesting. This all connects up with the FBI, believe it or not. Uh, uh, his wife, a little suspicious of all these strange 
desk in the town. And she goes, gets on a train and goes to Washington, from Oklahoma to Washington. And she looks up the president. And she talks to who was Calvin Coolidge at the time. And she has a moment with him and encourages him to do a little investigation. And he sends uh, somebody from a brand new organization run by a fellow named uh, Hoover, Edgar G. Is it Edgar G. Hoover, uh, back in the 20s, who was, was just starting the FBI. In fact, they called it the Bureau of Investigation, not the FBI. And uh, ultimately, to their credit, they sent a, a team of investigators down um, uh, to this uh, Fairfax town who began checking up on things. And they ultimately found at least some of the culprits, not all of them. Um, and it was very interesting that there was a certain level of justice, but not complete. And it shows you, when it, you know, the dodgy experience that federal, and this is just like what's going on with Trump these days, uh, the dodgy experience that federal investigators have when some people are lying and they can't really get their hands on the evidence. But ultimately, our friend DiCaprio went to jail, and I think, uh, he, I think he died in jail uh, many years later. And um, the same thing with um, the Robert De Niro character. I think he got out, but he died shortly after he got out. They, they tell you at the end, they get the radio play, right? At the end, where Martin Scorsese, this is a Martin Scorsese movie, he plays, he plays one of the announcers in the radio play. They review the whole movie in a radio play in the late 20s, I guess, in a radio studio. And Scorsese is, is part of that. And you say, wait, wait that guy looks so familiar. Huh, that's Martin Scorsese. He made the movie. <laughs> well, it, it's a gift because we we so know so little about this period of time and these relationships that were set in motion by a lack of any uh oversight or any federal or anything larger than the local sheriff. And so easily can can crime come into that and take over all, all that uh, is, is about the good and um, following the law. But I think that it is it is quite a statement about um, the value of um, an, a, a, a federal bureau of investigation or something to come in and be another uh, another lever for these people to call down for some checking and on on who's breaking the law here so i found it was a, a very good uh advertisement for a little more bigger government i mean yes ordinarily many many of these uh, small places even with tremendous assets such as this can get along and do it themselves but for the most part there is usually a little more um resource needed to make it all work out for everybody. But the FBI coming in and starting to show how they could go about uh, th this technical analysis of the situation when everybody else was just one wandering around, wondering, well, well, how come Joe's dead over there in the barn? And they didn't see any patterns. So they brought in that way of detecting whether there was criminal activity going on. And, I, and that's what the, they needed. And that's what I think this woman, the the main character, woman Molly Molly Burkhart, she is considered the soul of this movie because she was quiet, not 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 nonverbal, but very low verbal, but very um, insightful and um, always watching and listening and and knowing what's going on. And uh, she she could tell that there was another level of look at what they were experiencing. That needed to be taken. Yeah, the Indians are always going to funerals. Right. Uh, they that. were dying left and right. And uh, nobody was doing anything about it. And there was no investigation of any of those deaths. And she she decided she had to do something. So she went straight to the top and it worked. Um, for a well, quiet, diminutive you know, personality, uh, it had a lot of effect. It cleaned up the town. And a lot of guys went to jail. But, you know, one, one thing I, I, I just wanted to... Uh, Trip off what you were saying a minute ago. This is a great study of American history. It's a great study of the Indian situation. This is not a wounded knee or, a, you know, Custer's last stand. Um, the Indians were very docile. In fact, uh, the, the chief of the tribe says, gee, I wish it was the good old days. I'd go and kill some of these people, but it's not the good old days. I can't do that now. Uh, it's and they were wealthy, but but uh, they didn't know what to do with it, and they didn't know how to con control it. And 
and and the the the, the capitalists came to town and ripped them off left and right. It would have it would have gone on forever had Molly not gone to Washington. Um, and Molly is still going on. I mean, the right the the point is also made by some of the reviewers that this justifies this righteous fury and anger that indigenous people have towards the the uh, man, the white supremacy. Um, and the racism that they've had to endure uh, through all of these uh, centuries, and uh, and and have just lost lost lo incredible amounts of life uh, over it, and that that this is one piece of our fabric that we've we've not picked up the blanket, and looked under it much at all, and now through these this presentation, here's a, another picture of something that's not not a happy picture. But it is a, a story of how it is that America has grown and hopefully moved on from that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It really teaches you about the, uh, not so much the 19th century, which was bad enough, but the early part of the 20th century in, in middle America, uh, where there was um, racism to beat the band. There was crime to beat the band. Um, there was the police were corrupt. Even the doctors were corrupt. The whole town was full of corruption, um, and it's 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 of great concern that as recently as what a hundred years ago, that's all it was. Um, this was going on in Middle America, which was supposed to be civilized. It wasn't. And by the way, this is not too far from Tulsa, where in 1920 uh, a, a, a wild mob burned down the uh, the black part of, of the town of Tulsa in Oklahoma, the, the same state. Either Tulsa or Oklahoma City. I don't remember which, which it was. It might have been Oklahoma City. But by, bottom line is, uh, it was pretty rambunctious in those days. American history, you know, even a hundred years ago, was wild, and you could get away literally with murder, and robbery, and and abuse of people, and racism that that was just visible, um, palpable racism. So anyway, um, it teaches you about that. On the yeah. other hand, it is a great movie. Let's talk about the quality of the movie. Let's talk about the acting. You have a few minutes left, Stephanie. Well, as I said, I mentioned before that you, you barely can recognize De Niro and DiCaprio. I mean, they're so integrated with these these characters and their roles. I mean, they, it, it's a beautiful, continuously on on task. Uh, business that that they're doing, they're both of them. This has got to be some of the strongest work that that both of them have done. And of course, they say Scorsese has taken away some of the phenomenal fireworks that he usually throws in to get a more focus on the issues here that are are central to to this movie's message. And it, it's um are, these are the kinds of things, ways to get this information out to the public to be educated about these things that we're not educated about in school. And there seem to be, there seem to be um, pressures to not let this into our schools. And yet we need to know about these extremes of, um, of, of error and relationships that we've had, you know, with people that are not like us. It's a, it's just a part of the whole place where we are now at this time, trying to understand how to get along. But well, I always, I always watch to see the dynamic and Scorsese is certainly capable of that. Um, and he has made some unbelievably good movies in his life, in his career. But one one thing I noticed is that um, DiCaprio, who I suppose is the lead actor, um, doesn't really change. The dynamic remains about the same. He starts out being a wise guy. He starts out breaking the law. He's, he's robbing banks with a mask on and all this, even after he meets this, this woman. Uh, that he's supposed to have a romantic attraction to. Um, he's doing all kinds of really bad things, and he keeps doing them. And as I said before, he does them because he's stupid. The character is a stupid character, and he's being egged on by the mafia boss, um, that is uh, Robert De Niro. Um, and, uh, and he just, he gets worse, De Niro, as we go forward. So here are these two leading male characters who uh, form an axis of evil, um, and the Indians can't tell because they're being really sweet to them. Uh, they're talking to them up nice. They're complimenting them. They're talking about how wonderful it is to live in this town and live in peace and harmony with the Indians. 
It wasn't that at all. They were killing the Indians and they were stealing from the Indians. Um, so what you have is a dynamic, all right, but the, the dynamic makes them worse, not two of them, worse, not better. Uh, Molly, on the other hand, she has a dynamic too. She begins to understand. She never fully gra grapples with the notion that the man she loves is trying to kill her until the very end. And even then, she still loves him. It's a very interesting kind of romance. Um, and he, he will, you know, say something affectionate to her, but at the same moment, he slips you the poison. So I don't, I don't fully understand that kind of romance. Um, but she has a dynamic. Molly has a dynamic. She gets wiser, more, you know, uh, able to discern what is going on around her. But the two, De Niro and DiCaprio, they get worse. And, and, and they're beautiful, act, beautiful acting jobs. They're both magnificent in the way they play it. Well, I think that point is so good, Jay, about, about Molly, um, the, the soul of the film, is that she was l learning all of the time more and more. But, um, and, and the last thing she learned from what I could see at the end was that, yes, she was still taking the medicine from him and believing he was helping her. But but obviously, at the end, she had been told that he had been poisoning her while he was giving her this medicine. And it took her until the very end that she walked. She did turn away and walk away from him when he came to talk to her at the end. And that, that, that was right at the end. And yet she was invested in him and in, um, in, in, in romance with him and in love with him and believing and having faith in him because that was where she was in that marriage. And he was never even in it to be humane. Yeah, and, and the, that scene is just a, it's so memorable. There are many memorable scenes in this memory. You know, like at one point he says, what color are you? And, uh, you know, you're red, what are you? And she says, I'm my color. <laughs> but anyway, at the very end, uh, in the scene you refer to, uh, where you, you, you finally have the confrontation. She says to him, is there anything else you're not telling me? Is there any other crime or bad deed that you would like to tell me now? And he has not admitted that he was poisoning her. And he says, no, 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 that's it. Um, you know, I, may, I did some murders, but so that's it. And she looks at him and realizes that he's lying to her. And that's when it's a really incredible moment. Without more, without any words, without any accusations, she simply stands up and walks out of the room. That's the end of it. And later, sooner, she divorces him uh, for that. And that's her own life. That bitter, I mean, how they handle, you know, that bitterness must, you know, have been pervasive, you know, as people came to understand what was happening. I mean, and it's not just in this circumstance, but over all these enormous numbers of unfortunate uh, racisms and white supremacists taking it's tricky. over. It's tricky because they don't admit to racism. They just yeah. do it and they do it in the worst way because they're lying about it and they're telling the Indians, we love you. And while wow, they got their hand in the pocket. So anyway, so it's three and a half hour. Do you think it was too long? No, I never noticed that it was that long. I, uh, I knew it was before I went in, but it, it never came up again. I never felt that there was a drag at all. It was very engaging. I mean, we were seeing that, you know, an enactment of huge violence, actually, within this domestic, these domestic situations, as well as on the other layers of interaction in the community. But they came, the way the, the uh, white supremacy could work, it was with uh, just quiet power getting in there and working it without any regard for humanity or the law or God, or, or anything righteous. Only greed. Only greed. Yeah, and, and that's what the reviewers have said. Um, you know, I think this should have won a lot of awards. I don't know how many. It won, it didn't win Oscars. It was nominated, but um, it should have won a lot of awards. Why, why do I feel that way? First of all, the production values were unbelievable. And I don't know if you caught it, but on YouTube, there's a, there's a five or six minute clip uh, showing you how Martin Scorsese was directing and, you know, talk about attention to detail. I mean, oh. every frame 
and he would do it again and again so that it was just perfect. And that's what a great movie maker does, you know. Um, and then aside from, you know, the color and the lighting and the entity and all that, um, the acting was, was really astronomical. Uh, both uh, DiCaprio, I've never seen him in anything as good as this, even Gangs of New York, which was good. Um, and, and, uh, gee, when I mean, you look at Robert De Niro's career, this is the top of the line. He was such a character with that slight Southern accent and that smooth, avuncular, mafia don kind of control and everyone around him. It was amazing. And it made you believe that you were there and you could see through these guys. Um, you were physically in the room with them. That's what I call terrific acting. And she, she was lovable and she was totally Indian. She came from another culture and she was, um, as you said, quiet, um, and, um, thoughtful and, uh, so attractive that you almost believed DiCaprio when he said he loved her. She loved him, but he did not, I'm afraid he did not love her. So it was so intense. As you said, it was an easy three and a half hours because it kept on taking you in places. You didn't know, honestly, Stephanie, you didn't know where the thing was going. <laughs> no idea. That's true, actually. There, yeah, and, and when it wasn't bloody surprises what Scorsese usually does. It, it goes to places that you needed to see happen and to play out and to understand and to see, is this really true? I mean, I couldn't really tell that he, that the, the DiCaprio character was giving his wife, um, Molly, the poison with the medicine because, of course, he was distributing me good medicine that they had brought to her. So this is this is again that that uh, the, the violence, the the you know this violence that occurs in this quiet way that they had done all of this work to bring in the the, the diabetes medicine, and then the character William um, the uh, William Hale had brought in the the murderous poison to add to it so that we could get on with this next victim. And yet uh, I couldn't really see what they were doing at that point. It was after the fact that you find it out. You so, had to watch this movie very carefully or you would, you would miss a lot of times and say, you got to see it twice and you're going to be looking at it harder the second time uh, to catch all that nuance, to catch the details. So all of that considered, uh, what do you rate this movie uh, from zero to ten? What do you, what do you give it? Well, I I think we need more of this movie. I I I put it at um, the star, the ten, the ten stars, right? The ten, because of the importance of the topic and the and the and the and the capability of these actors to do these complicated uh, roles. Because we were seeing this duplicity and this evil acted out in, in layers. So, you know, they're good actors, they're acting the part, but then they were also acting over that it to be duplicitous and to take advantage of people who want to commit these murders and keep this whole complicated thing going. And you didn't really see them be themselves in the character going down to level one acting until like in the prison when the uncle, um, uh, William Hale and DiCaprio, Ernest, you know, they got together and, and, uh, the uncle begged him not to tell on him. So he did try. He came, he, he broke out. And even, even at the moment where his, his own freedom was an, an issue, uh, he was suggestible and to the mafia Don person. The other yeah. thing I found he, interesting is at this meeting, at this meeting, which they, the defense counsel phonied up in front of the judge, which was actually questionable. I mean, the judge was questionable too. Um, at this fancy meeting, between DiCaprio and um, his quote lawyer, it wasn't really his lawyer, and they wanted to try to get him to you know shut up, not say anything, not testify against William Hale. <clears throat> At this meeting, there's like five or six or seven oil guys representing at the time these major oil companies that were drilling for for oil in Oklahoma. You never see them before or after. That scene, but you realize that they're there running it all, uh, running William Hale. They're trying to get their hands on the oil. And, you know, and this, um, they were the real capital. They were the really dirty, filthy capitalists of the early 20th century. 
And I and I think that goes to the the rating of the movie. Now, some people didn't rate this movie highly. It didn't win as many awards as I thought. Um, but you know, it it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. If you care about American history, if you care about American Indians, if you care about the emergence of evil, you know, people in in sort of capitalist clothing in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, then you're going to rate it higher because, it, as we say. It's a movie you can learn from. It's an educational experience to be there. But if you'd rather see Captain Marvel, you're not going to see Captain Marvel in this movie. You don't learn anything from Captain Marvel. Uh, and so, you know, you and I would give it a higher ratings than some of the other people. I, I might add, by the way, there's a, there's a rating review in the New York Times in this movie that has just knocked your socks off. It is really wonderful. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post a link to it on our site. Anyway. So what would you give it? Ten? What? I'll give it a ten. I mean, the level of uh, of action and the layering of the acting, the actors acting over their characters, it was very, very, very complicated and, and very interesting to see the different perspectives that were working through all these layers, those that were taken advantage of, those that were subjugated, those that were oppressed, and then these other guys that were trying to keep it all into control. It was very interesting the way they that he laid all that out. The director managed to convey so much. Like what you say, you can see the movie again to see what was happening. And I'm sure it's representative. This is not a unique situation. It's very representative of the way evil can pervade the situation. And uh, when you have lawlessness and any lack of uh, higher oversight. Yeah, sure. Story of American history, American capitalism, American manifest destiny and you know lawlessness in this country and it's part of the way the country as you said it's part of the way the country you know developed and um i would add that it's all this uh, engagement with other cultures this was an example of that it's a clash of the indian culture which had a very which was so sweet and lovable really and and i think that's a true statement of it uh, versus these guys that had no moral compass whatsoever just ripping them off. And, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, we had a movie in, in about Hawaii and the indigenous people in Hawaii. Do you remember the movie? I forget the name right now, um, a few years ago, and it was very popular. And it was a story of, um, you know, the descendants, the descendants, remember? Oh, the descendants, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, about the same kind of thing with, Matt, uh, with, you know, uh, uh, you know, with it going down, uh, the chain of descendants and and people trying to maybe take advantage of that uh, and so forth and and I find it very interesting that they could make a movie in Fairfax, Oklahoma about the clash of cultures there and uh, you know that kind of d descendancy there and um, and we haven't really made any worthy movie here. Um, Martin Scorsese should come out and see what he can do for us and it would be it would be different but it would have the same strength anyway. We got to go now. I want to tell you, I would give it a 10 when I was negotiating with myself before. And I, I still, I'm still holding out for a 20. That's how good it, that's how good it was. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's great to talk to you. Great to review this movie with you. We'll do it again, Stephanie. That's good. Thanks, Jake. This was great fun. Take yes. Care. And a learning experience too. Aloha. <laughs>